Uh, it's good to be here, and I uh, appreciate your attendance here at our annual meeting. This, I guess, is the second occasion that we've done our annual meeting in Vancouver. Uh, and we have done that here for a couple of reasons, um, not the least of which we've had our co-headquarters um, located here since uh, 2007. And uh, Vancouver is a very important place for the mining industry. This is a mining center. This is a place where uh, lots of exploration activity is sort of originated. You know, the thought and the leaders in the exploration world, lots of them are here. And you think about the major mining companies in Canada, interestingly enough, um, two of the major ones are right here in Vancouver, and probably there's more that I'm not, I'm not thinking of. Um, so we're happy to be here, um, and we're happy to have our annual meeting here um, because it gives us an opportunity to communicate with the mining community here in, in Vancouver. And, and this is going to be a little different annual meeting than maybe some of them that you've attended because, as I was telling Amy, our auditor with BDO, I'm not going to talk any about financials or, or so if you're, if you're here, you know, hoping that I'm going to run through a set of financial statements and, and take you all the way through that income statement, all the way to net income. I'm not going to do that uh, to today, and I'm sure you're very disappointed about that. <laughs> um, but instead, I'm going to talk about things that we're doing to try to innovate our minds, um, to try to bring new technology in our minds to improve safety and productivity in the minds. Um, but before I do that, I'm just remiss in um, not adding, uh, not, uh, if, if I don't add my congratulations and thanks to you, Tony, for your service to Hecla Mining Company. It um, has been um, truly, a, a, you've been a truly a great contributor to the board, to the company. So thanks so much for, for all that you've done for Hecla. Um, Dave Shanko would be very upset if I didn't put this slide up that says that I'm going to make forward-looking statements, and, and if I do that, it's subject to the conditions found in our 10K and 10Q. So where is Dave Shanko? Um, I forget, am I supposed to introduce the, the uh, officers now or later? Anytime that you would like. Why don't I do that now since, <laughs> since Dave, so Dave, stand up. Dave's our general counsel. Uh, he's been with Hecla, geez, I guess seven years, seven years now. Um, thanks, Dave. Uh, Rob, Rob Brown is our VP of, of uh, Corporate Development. I want you to know this is the first occasion I can think of in Vancouver that he hasn't had a tie on, and it's at our <laughs> annual meeting and with everybody else with a tie. <laughs> Rob, Rob has uh, worked with Hecla for the past uh, um, two years, basically, uh, both as a consultant and as an employee. Um, George Sturgis. George Sturgis is our Vice President of Project Development and really was the author behind the development of the foreshaft at the Lucky Friday and, and sort of all of our projects of that sort. Carlos. Car Carlos is our Vice President of uh, San Sebastian in Mexico. Uh, um, if I was going to talk about the income statement, San Sebastian would have a very prominent role there with the, the value that it has generated uh, over the last year, and, and we're seeing more of that this year. Elaine. Elaine is our vice president. You notice I don't say the last names because I always mispronounce them. So, so Elaine, Elaine is, is our vice president at Casa Berardi. Elaine, you've been with Hecla for, what, about three years? Carlos actually has been with Hecla since 94, I think, 94. 96. Um, Carlos is a Mexican national, uh, worked at our operation in Venezuela for six, seven years, eight years, worked at the Lucky Friday for eight years in the mill, and you know, is now the, the GM. So I just mentioned that because I think it, it shows um, the talent that we have in, in Hecla and the international scope that we have. Larry Radford. Larry is our Vice President of Operations, Senior Vice President of Operations, and uh, has been with Hecla for, yeah, more than five years now, uh, and has 
Uh, we've had great success at continually improving our operations during that time, and Larry's been the, the real driver behind that. And, and lots of what I'm going to talk about was probably better if he was talking about it, because he is the, the, the real expert among, uh, among the, the senior management team. And, and so grab him after the meeting, and you can get the real straight scoop on this, this stuff. Dean McDonald, uh, our senior vice president of exploration, Dean has been with us since 2007, and uh, you know has uh, really been the architect behind the growth that we've had in our reserves and and resources. Uh, uh, you know, over the last 10 years, it's so in the time he's been here, it's grown 300 million ounces of silver that we've discovered in that that time. Um, our, we, we have roughly the most silver reserves in our history today as a result of that success. Lindsay Hall, our Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Lindsay has only been with Hecla roughly a year, and uh, we're so glad to have him on board as, uh, as we navigate you know, the, the, the changing world that we're in with you know, interest rates seems to be rising, and Prices are very volatile, and, and so we're glad to have him on board. Keith. Keith uh, is our vice president of, of uh, Greens Creek operation. Keith's been with us, what, about three years? Yeah, so three years. Uh, he's been in this role really since roughly the beginning of the, of the year. Prior to that, he was the, the, uh, the manager of the mine at, at Greens Creek. Okay, and who am I, who am I forgetting there? Ah, Luke, there he is way in Mark Board. There, so there's Luke Russell. Luke is our Vice President of External Affairs and he sort of deals with gover all the government entities. He deals with environmental matters. He's the guy that's responsible for advancing our permitting and particularly permitting on our projects that we have in Montana. And Luke's been with Hecla about five, four years, yeah. And then Mark Board. Um, lots of you know Mark, our Vice President of, of Technical Services. And uh, so in addition to Larry, Mark would be another person to grab to, to learn more about the, all the technologies that we, uh, that we have. So have I forgotten? Claire. Claire. Where's, where's, there's Claire Alexander. <laughs> Claire is our Vice President of the Lucky Friday. Uh, Claire has been there three years now. And uh, it, it's been so good to have Claire as part of the, the team uh, taking over as, as the GM of that operation. And then, of course, Mike Westerlin. Right there in the back, Mike is our Vice President of, of uh, in, uh, Investor Relations. He's the, so everything that you see that's gone on here, he's been the primary driver uh, behind this, uh, this, this meeting and having it here in Vancouver. Anybody else? Where's Carolyn? Carolyn Turner, our treasurer. And Carolyn has, uh, has been with Hecla about eight years now. And uh, is, is working with Lindsay on, you know, like one of the things we do is we hedge our base metals to try to manage our cash flows. And uh, has, she runs that program. And then Dan Nelson, our controller, Dan's been with Hecla and Greens Creek for 35, 32? 27. 27, God. <laughs> yeah. All I can tell you is that there isn't anybody that knows the statements better than Dan does, and particularly the statements of, of Greens Creek better than, better than Dan. So anybody else? All right. Yeah, Mike Clary. Where's Mike Clary? Mike is our interim HR director. Uh, Mike has been with Hecla and as an accountant, as a lawyer, and now as the uh, as the HR director for how many years, Mike? Twenty-three, 23 years, and uh, you know he's he is uh, the quintessential uh, jack of all trades. And, and master of many, so, uh, so, okay. So, 
as, as Ted said, safety is our primary consideration. And when we think about the innovations that we're doing, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that safety has been a, a, a big component of why we have put innovations into the mine, and I'll show you some specifically. But part of it is a drive to improve the safety of the company. Um, there's something that the National Mining Association put together about six years ago called uh, Core Safety. And, and for those of you that are not familiar with Core Safety, I would encourage you to go to coresafety.org. And if you go to that site, there's millions of dollars of intellectual property that has been made available by the mining industry that you can, you can use, and we've used it. And we've used it with the objective of making our mines safer. Uh, we want zero fatalities. We want to see our, our a, um, accident rate um, dropped in half from where it was five years ago. We're right on track to, to achieve that. Um, and we want to go even beyond that. But the, that's, that's been what the objective has been for the last five, five years. Now, I'm going to talk about innovation. And the context I'm going to talk about it in is, um, is in the context of a company that has been very focused on delivering value for shareholders um, for, for long time, but uh, I'm going to focus on the period of time that I've been at, at Hecla. Um, so, so one of the things that's very interesting about the company is the culture of the company, I think, has allowed us to be successful over the last 15 years. And that's a culture that I think I largely came into and have been able to be a part of. Um, but we've also had strategy, and I think the strategy has been successful and, and most importantly, because we've executed that strategy quite, quite well. And if you, so if you look at our performance over that period of time, we've done really well. And, and we're now looking at, OK, how do we extend that performance? How do we give even more value to shareholders going forward? And we really do think that it's by putting technologies and new ways of improving productivity into the mines. And so this is a complicated description of what our strategy is. And I won't go into, into it in too much detail, other than to say our focus is the core of our strategy is really focusing on long-lived mines and then with the idea of making them low cost. So when you think about our mines, one of the things you immediately come to, to the forefront is these mines are going to run for a long time long time. Um, and we will, over time, drive costs down. There's all sorts of other elements to it, but that's the core of the strategy. Um, when you have that, you have the ability to do the things that are at the top, grow your reserves and resources. I've mentioned that, grow production. We actually increased production about 50% last year grow cash flow. We saw that increase about, EBITDA increase about $150 million. I told you I wasn't going to talk about any finance. I can't help myself. <laughs> um, high return investments capture the price cycles. And the real thing we're focused on in 2017 is improving productivity. And this is really a, a drive that Larry is leading, is how do we make the mines more, more productive? And and we're doing it, we're, the focus is on innovation. And this is a slide that we've adapted from the Canadian Mining Innovation Council that Mark Board had the company join. And it's, it's modified um, because um, we're taking a different approach than many companies in the industry in that we're not trying to make everything sort of perfect. We're just trying to get, make things better we're just trying to take incremental steps to improving our operations. So we're fully connecting the mines. We're, we're not 100% there, but we're a long way there at Greens Creek and CASA and Lucky Friday will be following in, in short order. We're going to talk about how we're doing um, autonomous mucking that it's not quite continuous, 
but it's on that path to, to being continuous. We're certainly testing electric vehicles. Um, we're testing ore sorting and underground. Um, and, and so all of these things we're doing and we're doing today while this came out, what, uh, January of 2016, we're, we're, we think we're not necessarily ahead of the curve, but we're in many areas one of the companies that's as far along as any other company in the, in the industry. So I'm going to talk about lots of these things, and, but the reason we're doing this is, is that I came in the industry 31 years ago. So in 1986, I didn't realize that the industry had changed dramatically, that we were at a tipping point. When I say the industry, I'm talking about precious metals industry. And what happened was in the late 70s, heap leach technology really took off. And that completely changed the gold mining industry, completely changed the precious metals industry. And we believe that we're at another tipping point. We think the industry is changing fundamentally because of the technologies that are available. And I don't know if it's just one technology or if it's all the technologies together, but our industry is changing. And if you don't change, you're gonna get left behind. So those guys that didn't understand the heap leach technology and what it could do, they disappeared and other companies developed those, uh, those assets using those technologies. Um, and and I, I said our strategy is really to focus on long-lived, low-cost mines, and, you know, Greens Creek has been around for 30 years. We think it's got another at least 15 more years, 20 more years in front of it. Lucky Friday, this is actually the Lucky Friday 75th anniversary. And we believe this mine will operate clearly for another 25, 30 years and even, even beyond that. Casa Berardi um, has been around in one form or another since the 80s. Um, we think this mine will operate for another 20 years. San Sebastian doesn't quite fit into that mold. San Sebastian is a one, two, three year operation, but Dean and company are doing lots of exploration there, and we think that mine will ultimately become a long-lived mine. And if you have that long-lived mine and you have low enough cost, you have the margin and the capacity to try to innovate the mines. You have a, you have a rationale for doing it because it's going to be around long enough, and you have, uh, you have the, the opportunity to make those investments. So one of the first things we, that you have to do in doing this innovation is you got to start measuring things, and Larry is leading the charge on measuring how we operate. And this is just one example at Greens Creek, trying to gather the data to understand what, what, our, what we're doing and improve our, our performance, our productivity. And, and so one of the first things we did in this drive to innovate is we started to Wi-Fi Greens Creek. And we did it so that we would have proximity detection. We would know where employees are. So what this is is a, a chart or a, an image that shows where people are. These are the people, that's their number, and where equipment is. So well, we know where everybody is in the mine, and the machines know where the people are. So when they come close together, they talk to, to one another and so the operator of that machine now knows, hey, I've got a person in my proximity. We need to be careful. Maybe I need to shut down. Maybe I need to, to get in contact with that person. But try to make the mind. That was the driver of why we wanted to Wi-Fi. But then you go from that, and we've now got ventilation on demand in part, and we'll have it fully functioning this year at Greens Creek, where when someone goes into a heading, the ventilation will be at what the right level is for them and the piece of equipment that they have in that heading. So there'll be a cost savings. So while the drive was for safety, we're going to get cost savings uh, from that. And, and we've approached the, this whole innovation, I think, differently than most other companies in that we've said getting a little bit is enough 
and as we get a little bit of innovation, we'll look at how we, we can get more and we'll learn from that. And one of the first things that we're looking at is how to take advantage of that time during the shift change that is, is that where nothing's happening in the mine. So if you think about a mine 24 hours a day of potential operation and you got a shift change that takes a couple hours twice a day, you got four hours where nothing's happening. Maybe there's a way to do, to, to have something happen. And in fact, there is. I'm going to show you an automated LHD that's operating as we speak at Greens Creek. Well, I guess it's not the shift change, but today operated uh, at, at Greens Creek that takes advantage of creating value during this time of the, the shift change. Um, so this is a picture of the LHD. And so this man that you see right here, he's sitting at surface. And what he does is he will teach the LHD how to, to where to mine, where to, to, to um, dump the ore. And then after he teaches it once, he'll have it repeat that until the, the stope is mucked out. And so here's an image of that happening. So what you're looking at now is, a, is the camera. This is the view that that operator at surface sees. And, and, and so it's going down the stope. And now you're going to see what he's, where he's sitting at surface and this is this is what he sees. Now he has to teach that machine how to do it once and then it then it repeats the process. Really really cool stuff. Um, but that's not all that we've we've done at, at Greens Creek we've been focused on improving recoveries and over the course of the last three years we've seen recoveries in silver go from about 70 percent to 78 percent and we're now putting this wood grove um, flotation circuit our cells in. It's going to cost us about $1.3 million, and our expectation is it's going to generate a return of more than 100%. We're at Greens Creek looking at jumbos, and we'll have these in by uh, the benefits will happen next year. The jumbos where there's an aiming system that that allows the, the drilling to be more efficient, um, to be deeper, and to be in the right, right places. So you get a cleaner break from, uh, from these machines. The Lucky Friday, we made the investment on the, the foreshaft, and this foreshaft takes this mine to, um, to the 8300 level. And what it does is it, you now have this infrastructure in place you now have the ability to make, so this is a low return investment, but you now have the ability to make high return investments off the back of, of this. And at, the, and at the Lucky Friday, we're looking at battery powered equipment. So that's where we're testing uh, battery powered. This is, a, I guess, a yard and a half loader, um, and it's fully battery operated, and here's, here it is operating. You hear that electric whine to the, to the thing? So as noisy as that is, that's a lot quieter than the, the diesel engine. Now, we don't know if this is where we'll ultimately go. We're testing it, but it has you know, the opportunity to reduce the diesel particulates in the heading, make it, from a health standpoint, safer for the, for the miner. Um, has, has the opportunity to, as a result to also reduce the amount of ventilation that we need to do so it could also lower the costs of our operating. Pretty cool, huh? That's all battery. Um, and we're looking at a continuous miner. And I've, I failed to mention, you know, we're going to have these booths. Um, one, of the, one of them is this 3D, and it's really quite cool. You put this on and you go in and you actually see that what we're looking at constructing uh, in a, for a continuous miner. And we're doing this because we think 
this is a way to improve safety and the productivity of the, of the lucky Friday. Um, and if this is successful, this is the sort of thing that could revolutionize the, mi the mines of the sort that we're mining, these narrow vein mines. Uh, this is at Casa Brardi. We've We've done a big increase in the throughput at the Casa Brardi because of the mill that we have on, on site. Uh, it had more capacity than what we're using from the underground, and we've done that by opening pits at surface. Um, and, and so this provides flexibility within the mine. This makes it where um, there's less pressure on the underground to deliver feed and makes it where you can have more time to, to more selectivity as to where you're working uh, underground. And here's an image of the pits. And, and so in one year, or the pit, one year the progress that we've made. And we think there's going to be a lot more pits at, uh, at Casa Berardi. <clears throat> Casa is really leading, is one of the leading lights. Uh, you know, Casa, Greens Creek, in particular, these are both places where the, the, there's so much innovation that's happening from the, the mines themselves. So they've gone in and they've taken the, the hoist and they've actually automated the hoist and then they have the hoistman runs the rock breaker remotely. Um, interestingly, I was talking to this hoistman and he said, I love the fact that I'm operating the rock breaker. It gives me the opportunity to stay fully engaged and sharp while, you know, with, with just running the hoist, particularly when it's in the auto automated mode, he, uh, he says the, 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 the day becomes quite long because he, he doesn't have enough to do, basically. Uh, so, so I talked about what they were doing at Greens Creek with this aiming. Well, this is the stope. So we've, we've actually are automating the stope, and it's allowing us to continue to operate during the shift change. They, they start a hole, they, and, and then the stope drill completes the hole when they, uh, when they do the shift change. And the, the aiming system, they're already doing that at CASA that I talked about at Greens Creek. And then this is kind of, not everything has to be high tech. This is kind of cool. What this is, is this is the material that's coming out. Um, you know, this is, is representing a feed, a crusher feed chute. And this is a test. And what you can see is really hard to get the material to go through that little, little chute. So what they did was they put this baffle. Pretty cool innovation, that low cost. Uh, it's made a huge difference right a lane at uh, Casa Berardi. And this is a list that, that Elaine showed, showed us yesterday at our board meeting, all the different projects that they're working on in, in innovating the mine. Uh, um, you know, they've got continued work on their Wi-Fi system. They've got this mine operations center. So basically, they're going to have a place where they know here's where the people are. Here's where the equipment is. This is what the status is of everything. One, one place that all of this is, uh, is happening. Um, and they're automating um, the uh, moving material on this automated, the 985 automated drift. So this drift is only going to have automated equipment on it. Um, it's, it's a technology that's actually been around for about 10 years. Uh, and we've, uh, we've got the truck ordered, uh, the first truck, and we'll end up having two. And you're going to have these, this tr these two trucks go back and forth on this kilometer and a half drive. Um, so we'll see cost savings there, and, and we'll see better operation, and we can buy less equipment uh, to operate off that. Here's an image of it, and you'll have these chutes, an image of the level. You'll have these chutes that will be will automatically fill, and then you you've got to have someone do the uh, the the dumping that will be will be remote but not autonomous. And we're doing ore sore testing. Uh, Dale Dean is uh, going to you know if you go over to the little uh, next door when we have the displays, he'll show you what we're doing 
with, uh, with ore sorting. Th this might be the, the thing that changes at least our part of the industry. And what this represents is as we reduce the amount of, if we, as we sort the ore and we re reduce the amount of tons, um, the grade goes up. And that's huge if you're not losing too much of the, of the metal. Uh, and we're doing testing at San Sebastian, we're doing testing at Hosco, and we're seeing very good results. And so there's a huge opportunity to fundamentally change lots of properties because you can essentially raise the grade of the property. And we're doing things on the expiration side. Here's uh, the Raman spectroscope. Um, I hate that, 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 you know, these words. Um, but um, what this basically does is it, it's an opportunity to, in, with one shot of a, of a mobile gun, look at the rock and determine what you would have had to do f with fluid inclusions over the course of six months. You can do it uh, in real time. And the geologist can now understand where this is from a fluid inclusion standpoint and change their exploration program on the, on the fly. So the real focus for the next few years, I think, is going to be on continuing to improve our productivity and using innovation, using technology to do that. So with that, I will stop and answer the questions that folks have asked.